It's uh, Paul George with History of Miami, resident historian, uh, back for a, another talk today. Uh, looking forward very much to sharing with you the story of Coral Gables, which is such a compelling story, as a lot of you all know. I thought we would just wait a moment for uh, some people to tune in. It's just about 3 o'clock, and uh, I do want to leave a little time at the end for questions that anyone might have, as we have in the past. But uh, looking forward very much to this Coral Gables story. Um, it's a booming community today and has been for a long time, but there was a time when it wasn't uh, because of the economic downturn of the late 20s in the greater Miami and Florida areas, as well as the National Depression that followed after that. But uh, I think if ever a city that is now 100 years of age, uh, the, the beginnings of Coral Gables really began in November of 1921, so it's almost 100 years of age, is associated with one person and whose memory and name is still very, very strong, it is Carl Gables with uh, George Merrick. And uh, so I'm, I'm delighted that we could uh, share this story with you today. We do have coming up uh, on Wednesday the story of Alapata, which was never a city or an incorporated entity, uh, but it has a fascinating history, a lot different in many ways than Carl Gables. And then we wrap up this series on Friday with a uh, discussion about uh, Miami Springs, uh, which also has such a unique story. You know, its location, Everglades Swampland at one time. Uh, it's been, in many ways, a bedroom community over time for the huge airline industry that has graced Miami since the late 1920s and certainly throughout the 30s and thereafter. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to to share with you some of these stories. And, of course, I'm, I'm always open to questions anybody might have. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, a lot of y'all are kind of tuning in. I think it's great. I'm honored. History of Miami is delighted to offer this to you, and I'm glad that uh, you're taking advantage of it. I've heard from a lot of people, in fact, about this. So let's begin then with Coral Gables. And I think, again, if you really want to begin the story of Coral Gables, we need to know a little bit about the, the physical ambiance of the place. Uh, if you were like the Merricks arriving in Coral Gables in 1899, George Merrick, who was the oldest of the Merrick siblings with his father, the Reverend Solomon Greasley Merrick, and you traipsed over to today's Coral Gables, you would have been in a Piney Woods area that had no name. Uh, in fact, early references to it in newspapers were it was an extension of Coconut Grove. And um, the Merricks arrived there. They had bought sight unseen 160 acres of land from a homesteading family from South Carolina, the Gregory family. Uh, the land would be around where the Coral Gables house is today at 907 Coral Way, and that whole area around it on all sides of it, 160 acres, again, based on the Homestead Act of, of uh, 1862. They paid $1,100 for all that property, if you can imagine that. And uh, they weren't by themselves. There was already a growing community, five, six, seven families who were also homesteading their own 160 acres in that area. Uh, today's Coral Way was known as Jackson Road. Wasn't renamed that until some time later. Uh, and, and these folks were cultivating a wide array of crops. It could be peppers and tomatoes, citrus, which grew pretty well out there, guavas. In fact, um, one of the names that uh, the Merrick family applied to their community to their own holdings was Guavonia because there was such a proliferation of guavas believed to be brought in from the Bahamas about a half a century before that time. And they really flourished uh, in the South Florida soil and the South Florida climate. The Merricks came down here. George Merrick and his family hailed from Springdale, Pennsylvania. And uh, the Reverend Merrick and his wife met in college. Uh, George was born in Springdale in 1886. The Reverend Merrick was a congregational minister. He was an itinerant minister. Family had lived in Duxbury prior to moving down to the wilds of Southeast Florida in 1899. And um, it's outside of Boston, cold weather there. They lost a child in part because of exposure to the cold weather. And, uh, they decided it was really time to move on, and they had heard about a congregational church down here where there might be an opportunity for the Reverend Merrick uh, to begin to be active uh, as a minister in that church, and that would be today's plan of the Congregational Church. So all of these factors came to play when the Merricks moved down here. Althea Merrick, the matriarch of the family, known as Allie, affectionately by the family, uh, was a very accomplished uh, artist. In fact, some of her paintings still hang on the walls of the Carl Gables house that she designed at the outset of the 1900s to replace the couple of wood frame cabins that the Gregory's had left behind 
on that property. And that house was built over a period of nearly 10 years, called Coral Gables, the house, as well as their agricultural uh, farming efforts, Coral Gables Plantation, uh, probably because the Reverend Merrick was a fan of uh, President Grover Cleveland, who had a home near Duxbury, Massachusetts, uh, by the name of the Gray Gables. And so this became a, a little alteration, and the name became the name of the, the homestead, the business, and of course, ultimately, the city itself. Um, the uh, Mrs. Merrick founded a school there, and according to the rules of that era, you had to have 10 children who were school age uh, to qualify for a charter from Dade County, which stretched all the way up from the Northern Keys to the St. Lucie Inlet, to uh, qualify for a, uh, a school charter from the Dade County Public School System. And uh, as the story goes, and it, it, with every school you hear the same thing at that time in these frontier outposts, they had nine students of age and they were somehow able to get somebody's little brother who really didn't qualify because of age to become the 10th and thus they met the charter. So as a result, uh, they had a school and it was called the Guavonia School. And the, um, the headmaster, if you will, was Althea Merrick and the school operated right there on the property of the Merrick family. So they were very enterprising people and very successful in farming. The Reverend Merrick would die toward the end of the first decade of the 20th century, but his mother and uh, George, excuse me, his wife George and other members of the family would carry on. And um, they were especially successful in cultivating citrus, especially grapefruits, but they had a lot of guavas, they had peppers, they had tomatoes, a whole bunch of things. They were probably the foremost exporters of uh, grapefruits uh, in Florida. And uh, to show you how successful they were, the Coral Gables Plantation, as the farm was officially known and as it was incorporated, according to uh, records we have in 1914, uh, the worth of George Merrick and his mom, and they were the two principals then in this farm, in this corporation, their, net, their worth at that time in 1914 was $312,000 which by today's standards would be more than $7.4 million. So here were people who worked hard, were very not only industrious, but uh, innovative, and they really realized the benefits from that. Um, George had long been a, a scholar uh, in a sort of a non-formal way. He would visit the library in Coconut Grove, which stood about where the library is today on McFarland Road in Coconut Grove. He would make a, a weekly traipse through the woods on a diagonal of that library and check out books. He was always reading read voraciously each day, besides working. And he was a poet, and he wrote a lot of poetry, and wrote some short stories. All of these things he was involved in. He began, he was a dreamer too, and a visionary. He began to dream of a planned city. And as he grew older in the 1910s, um, he got into real estate, and he also was a member of the Dade County Commission. In fact, he was one of the guys that pushed hard for an expansion of the road system. Some of the roads would bring people ultimately close to his Coral Gables. And uh, so, so George dreamt that and believed that there would come a time when he could develop at least part of that property into a beautiful planned city. He was influenced by a lot of things. Shaker Heights, Ohio, outside of Cleveland, a planned city. The World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, Frederick Law Olmsted's designs, a lot of stuff he had read. Uh, and so he really had a, he had a good education, self-taught, uh, in how to lay out a city that would be not only functional, but also be beautiful. Uh, he had a lot of real estate ventures by the 1910s. In fact, that was the decade in which he married the beautiful Eunice Peacock, granddaughter of Charles and Isabella Peacock of Coconut Grove fame. And uh, his real estate ventures took him around today's Flagler Street and 37th Avenue, points east of there, points west of there. Uh, in fact, at one point he was developing and selling about seven small subdivisions in that area. He became a principal in one of the prime real estate companies of that era, something called the Realty Securities Corporation. Um, meanwhile, he was putting away money uh, and he was planning along with his wife and he began to hire a really outstanding group of planners to put on paper and then take off paper his idea of a model city that would be influenced by castles in Spain. It would have a Mediterranean Spanish motif to it. Although initially in those early buildings, it really didn't. But we'll see that as we get through this lecture. And um, the team included uh, an uncle who was Althea's brother, um, a man by the last name of Fink. Uh, his son, H. George Fink. So you had Denman Fink, the uncle. You had George's cousin, 
H. George Fink, who became a licensed architect. Demon Fink was a prominent illustrator. In fact, the grandfather who got a kick out of this was, was selling what I guess what today we call snake oil and really prospered uh, as part of that whole scene. I won't call it a scam. Uh, he also had Frank Button, who had gained renown for what he had done at the um, Chicago White City of 1893 in terms of landscape design. Phineas Pace, who came from Philadelphia, uh, he was in charge of colors at one point and then became an architect also there. And Doc Damers, who was a high-powered pitch man, I mean, he could sell anything, usually from the vantage point of standing on a wagon and kind of waving his hands with something in it. And he could sell land uh, very easily. He had done this in... Uh, West Palm Beach, he had uh, done it in Boca Raton, on Miami Beach with Carl Fisher. So he was a really accomplished salesman. That's just what you needed. I won't call him a huckster, but he was a very interesting character. Uh, early Carl Gables, well, um, Merrick w took his time. He actually developed some homes because his father also was entrepreneurial long before his death and envisioned the Gables ultimately as a place where retired ministers would come to live out their years. And Merrick took over for his father, and he built a series of rock houses. Part of the property he had would be today's Venetian Pole, which was a rock quarry initially. And so he, he took rock from there, and uh, he built homes along Carl Way in the 1910s, 1916, 1918. And those homes still stand, and they're, they're gorgeous in their own sort of masonry, rock vernacular manner. Uh, he was finally ready in 1921 to unveil his Carl Gables. He had accumulated by then 1,600 acres of land. He had this staff. He was beginning to advertise widely. He had some clever ideas. People dressed as Spanish conquistadors. He had people dressed up in Spanish conquistador uniforms all the way from downtown Miami out to Coral Gables to lead people out to it. He set the date of November 21st, 1921 as a day that sales would officially begin in Coral Gables. And... Um, by then, he'd already named a lot of streets. He and his wife and other members of their planning staff had, had consulted Washington Irving's uh, Tales of Alhambra for street names, among other things, uh, because Irving mentioned in that book, of course, many old Spanish cities, and those cities' names would become some of the earliest street names there. He also, in the mode of really astute planners of that era, began to lay out infrastructure before he sold anything, uh, such, such as arch entranceways, 1922, the Granada entrance off of 8th Street and about 46, 47th Avenue. Uh, plazas like Ponte de Leon Plaza, which would be on Coral Way at the confluence of today's Coral Way um, and Alhambra. Um, he uh, created a golf course, but that would come a little bit after sales went on. The golf course first opened on January 1, 1923. Already the country club was there. So the amenities were there. The alluring elements of a, a community were already around. Uh, at the time, he began to put uh, his lots on the market for sale. He called it the master suburb, and he had 1,600 acres he was ready to sell and develop. Uh, his mantra at the time was, Followed the galleon, and he had again these Spaniards, and he had these ships and all heading right to Carl Gables, paper mache's, of course. And in late November, then, and I meant to say November 28th, apologies, 5,000 people, an estimated 5,000, appeared for that first day of sales in front of a home that's still there, a home that he built, designed by a man named Harry Hastings Mundy, a tremendous architect at the time. It's a rock frame vernacular home called Point Siena Place on Coral Way, about four or five doors down, same side of the street, west of the Coral Gables house itself at 907 Coral Way. And there was Dammer selling, and it was a tremendous turnout, and there were lots of sales. So he was very much on his way in terms of development at this time. Uh, as Coral Gables developed, uh, he kind of looked around, and he worked very closely with the staff, and uh, he was, he was a, a no-nonsense kind of a guy. If he didn't like a plan that somebody had put in front of him for a design, He'd say, I don't like it. I want you to go back and come back with another plan. That'll be acceptable to me. Very blunt about things as he had to be. But as it grew, uh, Carl Gables uh, was just about ready to encompass this rock quarry where that stone had been quarried for the early homes. And Merrick said, we got to do something with this. So he met with his uncle, Dem and Fink, and they decided, I don't even use the, the old cliche, but let's use it anyway to, to take a lemon and make a lemonade. That's what he did with the Venetian pool, which was known as the Venetian pool and casino which was a common name for pools that had cabanas and what have you at the time. 
And so a beautiful Venetian pool opened in 1924 is still another great amenity for this community. The early homes, as I mentioned before, were more in the arts and crafts style, although they were rock vernacular. Um, and many of them centered around this golf course that had opened up in 1923. There was a great expansion of holdings in 1924. Uh, new properties were purchased. New land was purchased by Merrick. Uh, he began construction of the Coral Gables sales office in the Coral Gables building. We know it as the Colonnade today. Tremendous building that when it was finished in 2627, he at that point was too destitute to do anything with it. The Mediterranean style of architecture was now embraced totally. Plans are announced for a Biltmore Hotel, a Grand Hotel. And then, of course, we arrive in the, the peak year of the great real estate boom in 1925, which, uh, as a point of disclosure, is one of my favorite periods in Miami history. I've studied it forever. I've written about it forever. Uh, it was an amazing period when the price of everything skyrocketed. All these subdivisions appeared, something like 971 subdivisions, ranging anywhere from a block or two to you know, a small town of some kind. Uh, he had creative advertising that went nationally, very surrealistic, colored paintings and newspapers and magazines. There were, to show you the extent of the boom, there were sales offices on East Flagler from Miami Avenue on both sides of East Flagler, moving east to southeast, northeast, 3rd Avenue. That's about a three-block area. More than 120, excuse me, more than 150 sales offices uh, of different developers, real estate offices. Uh, probably the most beautiful was Merrick's. It stood immediately west of where today's Olympia Theater is. Olympia wasn't built until 2526. And uh, it was a beautiful Moorish design building. He kept changing its design and making it even more attractive. Uh, many building projects were underway in Carl Gables at this time. They announced the opening of the arts and crafts section, which would be south of today's Miracle Mile along Ponce. There were vast waterfront uh, acquisitions because I think Merrick by 1925 was hearing this mantra, Mr. Merrick, we love what you have here, but you're landlocked in an area with so much water. So he went out, spent $6 million, not all of it at once, paid to the Daring Brothers, this is 1925, James Daring and his half-brother Charles Daring, for a large swath of waterfront property um, so he could build the future Biscayne section, which would include Tahiti Beach, today's Cocoa Plum area, among many places, Gables by the Sea, Gables Estates, all of that was part of this package. They would purchase later on uh, so much of the waterfront of Key Biscayne. Uh, it was just, you know, he just it never stopped his... His ideas were grandiose, his plans were grandiose, his spending was prodigious. And all the money he made, he, for the most part, put back into his development. So he didn't really have a lot of liquid on hand if there was a rainy day, and indeed there's gonna be a big rainy day coming. Uh, he introduced the, the Riviera section of Carl Gables around where the University of Miami is today. Thematic villages like the Dutch South African village, the ideas for this. The Douglas entrance construction began on that in the mid-20s. The Congregational Church really built in honor of his father, uh, a man whom he really idolized. And his father was a very difficult guy to get along with, dour and given to a lot of moodiness and what have you. Um, please, George, don't hold that against me for saying that. Um, a military academy uh, close to where Carl Gables Elementary School is today. An interurban or trolley system that went all the way down into downtown Miami along today's Carl Way, South Miami Avenue, crossed into downtown and then came back out. Um, the University of Miami, on land donated by Merrick, 160 acres, and he pledged more than $5 million toward his construction. The incorporation of Coral Gables in late April of 1925 under a ficus tree that still stands at 907 Coral Way uh, in front of the house. If you looked at the land sales in that peak year of the boom for Coral Gables, they came out to more than $100 million in property sales and in terms of the value of building permits issued by this new entity of the city of Coral Gables, more than $25 million uh, in building permits. So things were just booming. George's estimated wealth at that time, he was regarded as one of the wealthiest people in the United States at that time, his wealth, at least on paper, because a lot of this meant money coming in on monthly or semi-annual payments, was anywhere between 75 and $100 million. So this man had really struck it rich, and mainly through his own creativity and endeavors. But then the bus came in 1926 for a host of reasons we won't get into today for the sake of time. It, uh, sales began to fall precipitously. The boom was over by the summer of 1926. 
uh, which was unfortunate for Carl Gables in a, for a whole host of ways, including the fact that the Biltmore had opened in January 26th and experienced financial troubles right from the beginning, that great hotel, singular building. University of Miami had fallen a receivership a few years after this. It wasn't even able to open on its original designated campus till 1946. And then, of course, there was the mighty hurricane in 1926, which done a lot of damage to the northern sectors of the city of Carl Gables. George Merrick had a never give up mentality. And uh, through bond issues, they even broke ground after the downturn began on a new city hall, today's city hall, uh, to finish the Prado entranceway, which is one of the most beautiful entranceways off of 57th Avenue and 8th Street uh, into Carl Gables to complete a Ponce High School, Ponte de Leon High School, where the middle school is today. Coral Gables Seaboard Airline Railroad Station opened up, if you can imagine this, um, in a distant part of western Coral Gables at the time. Uh, but Coral Gables was in sad shape. In fact, to show you how bad it was, it too went into receivership by the early 30s. Um, the city only issued in the year 1932 four building permits. There's a, some sprouts of hope a little later than that. And you begin to see homes that I guess today you would call Mediterranean modern. They have elements of the emergent Art Deco style as well as elements with barrel tile roofs of the earlier Mediterranean style that uh, George in many ways had introduced uh, to the area. Uh, the war came along and uh, the Great Biltmore Hotel, which had gone through the hands of three different owners by this time, became the Army Air Force Regional Hospital, AKA Pratt General Hospital. Later on, it became the Veterans Administration Hospital. And eventually, by the 1980s, it is returned as the Biltmore Hotel. There was a tremendous post-World War II boom all over America, consumer spending driving it. And Coral Gables, of course, experienced that. And so you begin to see a lot of new building as you're moving south away from the historic and architectural core of the Gables into what we call Florida ranch-style homes on the other side of US-1 as you're progressing toward the bay itself. Just a vast amount of building that went on there. Um, Carl Way, which was a sort of a godforsaken street, the original downtown street, the main street, was supposed to be Ponte de Leon Boulevard. That's why it's so wide and all. But when the boom collapsed, it never really developed according to the ideas of George Merrick. I mean, a movie theater did open, a couple of movie theaters opened. Uh, Carl Gables Elementary was already up and going, but uh, there was a lot of empty places there. After the war, George had died in 1942 at age 56. After the war, the, the, the whole... A new breed of leaders of Coral Gables said, listen, let's take Coral Way, let's gussy it up with a new name, let's call it Miracle Mile after Wilshire Boulevard in Santa Monica, or maybe the Miracle Mile along the lake in Chicago, and let's make sure that all the buildings we build have air conditioning and have parking and back and things of this nature. So that became the main retail street, and it was a very successful street uh, for at least a couple of decades before malls began to steal a lot of its thunder. Today, of course, it's come back pretty well. And then in the 1970s, with the uh, sprouting of all kind of tall glass buildings around Alhambra and downtown and places like that, Carl Gables began to, I think, appreciate, reappreciate its past. And uh, the name George Merrick became prominent and meaningful again, as well as um, economic incentives by the 80s to developers to build in sort of a nouveau Mediterranean or Nouveau Spanish style. That's why you have so much of that uh, Mediterranean design in the newer buildings in downtown Coral Gables. So historic preservation really becomes a big thing. Um, they create, the city does, the first historic preservation board. Uh, and they began to designate buildings and begin to do a lot of preservation. Today, of course, it's an international city. It's about 13 square miles, more than 60,000 people. But it's also headquarters of more than 120 international businesses and something like 20 plus consulates. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, it's been a, it's been an amazing ride for a century, uh, up and then down and then really up in the last, uh, many decades. There's a wonderful study of George Merrick's, lots of things have been written in the Gables, but I think the preeminent study would be by our friend Arva Parks. She spent about 20 years on this study. It's a biography of George Merrick entitled, son of the south wind visionary creator of coral gables and i had the good fortune to read the manuscript before it was published and was asked by the publisher of the university presses of florida uh, for an evaluation of it and of course it was easy to give it an a plus it was really outstanding so i'd like to answer any questions anybody might have now i know i'm very long-winded uh, but let's um 
Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at um, some of the questions. Did any World War II military training occur on the grounds of the Granada Golf Course? I can't tell you if they did or not. They, they, they did happen on the grounds of the University of Miami out where the campus is today. They did happen on the grounds of the Biltmore Hotel. Um, Jacqueline called my great-grandfather was Charles Francis Jack Baldwin, who was one of the first commissioners of Coral Gables, Seymour, and was credited by Merrick for saving Carl Gables when he came up with the funding to help get Merrick ooh, out of debt and help the state. It, it's, it's very, very real, exactly what you're talking about, and that is in Parks's book. Uh, and we want to thank Mr. Baldwin for that. Thank you. Um, from John Borsa, do you have any information on the unbuilt Mahai Shriner, Shriners Country Club in the Riviera section? It was going to be built in the same area uh, as Ponte de Leon High School, which is, again, today the middle school. But as you've indicated, it was never built. Things had collapsed by that time. Merrick's pledge, in fact, to build the University of Miami, he did donate uh, through securities and other things, something like a million plus dollars for it, but his pledge was like over five million. And he just ran out of money. So they did break ground for one building on the campus to be named for his father. And it's still, I think, the Merrick building. But that was unfinished uh, and wasn't completed till the end of the 1940s when the campus was activated in 1946. Um, from Fort Lauderdale, okay, just uh, thanking us for this history that we're sharing. Where exactly was Tahiti Beach and how did it operate? Tahiti Beach was uh, one of the, the great attractions for the Biscayne section of Coral Gables. That was the land that Merrick purchased from the Darings. And that land, uh, before the collapse of everything, experienced hardly any development. There were a couple of homes in that property, just past the entranceway uh, to Cocoa Plum today, that were completed by 1928. Uh, the Tahiti Beach was completed before that, and that was actually accessible to the public as late as the 1960s. And then the Cocoa Plum people would purchase that property, I believe at the outset of the, of the 70s, and we'd close that off. That is the most uh, upscale part of Cocoa Plum today, would be Tahiti Beach, as it uh, abuts the bay. We have Sue Skinner watching from Tallahassee. Hey, that's great. Can you speak to the supposed haunted Biltmore from Terry Munoz Velez? Well, Terry, you're speaking to the right guy since I was born on Halloween. There was a um, there was a thug, a Fatty Walsh, who was killed in the Everglades Suite, which is in the the the, the top the top two floors of the Biltmore under the cupola, and uh, he was killed in 1929. Probably a gangland killing, and it's believe that his ghost permeates the Biltmore. And then there's stories about um, some of the shelves in um, what would today be the French restaurant of the Biltmore that one day they shook for any reason at all uncontrollably. Things fell to the floor and a couple of people who were working there witnessed this. And so it just kind of goes on and on. Uh, and, and the stories go on and on. We'll have to wait for Halloween, I think, to share the others. Uh, from Lady Rada, who's been such a, uh, a wonderful follower of these programs. I never knew uh, that was how Miracle Mile got its name for Chicago's Magnificent Mile. <laughs> Thank you. Or maybe maybe um, Wilshire Boulevard's portion in, in Santa Monica. Um, Julie Brady, what do you think of Bubble in the Sun? I've read it, Julie, so long ago. I liked it, but so long ago. Um, Karen McCammon, who's one of our best supporters, and her husband Bob is a great guy also, she said she was at uh, Tahiti Beach many times, for sure. It was a great place. Uh, Sheila loved riding her bike to Tahiti Beach, camped in the area, too. Here's Casey here. The unfinished Merrick building was referred to as the UM Skelton. It was the Skelton for years. Again, the campus opened there in 46, aided, really, by the GI Bill. Uh, the University of Miami had struggled terribly, and that GI Bill meant that you had people, you had an influx of thousands of vets, among others in 46, who would have their tuition paid uh, because they were vets. What is the history of the White House near the golf course? Um, I believe that's what you're referring to, the, the water tower there that's cloaked as a lighthouse. You know, that was one of the first examples of historic preservation in the Gables. There was talk about taking it down in the second half of the 60s, and uh, there was a fight to keep it up, and that really is the jump start. That and saving the Douglas entrance to Coral Gables. Willie Dry up in North Carolina. Hi, Willie. Enjoying your comments? Could you elaborate a little on the personality of Merrick's father? He, um, he just seemed to be a guy that was, was struggling a lot um, with himself. And um, 
George was an upbeat guy, and uh, and his father just wasn't. And I think he would sometimes go into the moods where he just wasn't a happy guy, you know, unfortunately for him. Strong building codes in Carl Gables, yes. It's, it's Sheila, thank you. Um, hi, Jim. Let's see, I just want to make sure we get maybe one more question. I know I'm, I'm very long-winded, but there's so many great questions here. Thank you, Commissioner Baldwin. Or Bay too, part of the Biscayne area. This is Sheila. My father was a developer builder in Carl Gables. Yes, indeed, and you're 100% right. Uh, how about Terry? I learned to swim in the Venetian pool. Terry, I'm, I'm a poor swimmer today. Of course, I'm old now. I'm a poor swimmer today. One of the reasons being, I could never quite get used to how cold that water was at the Venetian pool. Uh, Victor Vincent, when John Harrison was on the board of Hassel, he showed me one of Merrick's original planning maps for the gables oh yeah it's just elaborate stuff okay i tell you what yeah carl gables is indeed steve richards on high ground and uh that's very 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 important especially if we deal with rising waters where can we learn even more about guavonia uh i, I really think the the arba park study is an excellent one and there's a lot of other books that have been written on different facets of the gables and um I think if you just went online, you'd probably see a whole bunch. Um, Melissa Meyer asked me if I would take over editing the set of short stories by Merrick that Arbor Parks was working on. God bless her. Um, I don't know. I'll think about it, but uh, I couldn't do it as well as she. Listen, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thanks so much, uh, folks. Here's Vincent. He used to play on the old uh, nine-hole Carl Gables Granada golf course. Um, I want to thank you all for tuning in. There's so many other people, too, with comments. But uh, we'll look forward to seeing you with a completely different uh, community to discuss on Wednesday, and that is Alapata. And I've been able to conduct a few tours, a couple by bus and a couple walking, and it's a completely different animal, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So thank you so much for tuning in today, and we'll look forward to seeing you and talking with you soon, okay? We want to thank History Miami also for sponsoring these talks. Have a great day. Bye-bye now.